Grace, mercy, and peace from Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Continuing our sermon series today on Jesus' Beatitudes, that sermon called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus preached it on a mountain to his disciples. And so we've done the first uh, seven Beatitudes. We're on the eighth one today. And we're going to look at verse uh, 10, but I'm going to include verses 11 and 12 because that goes along in the same theme. So let's take a look. Without further ado, picture yourself uh, going up those slopes again, and we'll sit down there with Jesus on the mountaintop and have him teach us again of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Let's take a look. Matthew 5, verse 1 and then 10 to 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when Jesus sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then verses 11 and 12 as well. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. So today, on this mountaintop, what does Jesus mean to teach us about the kingdom of God through these words? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's see what we can learn about that today for our help and encouragement in Christ. What can we say? The first thing we can say, Kevin knows this really well. Don't jump ahead. Let me ask you. <laughs> this is... Uh, Jesus is declaring to us a blessing, which in the Greek is? Oh, beautiful, Kevin. Which means, blessed, happy, and joyful are you when you are what? When you are persecuted, he says here, for righteousness' sake. In other words, this is a blessing declared to the persecuted, that the kingdom of heaven, my kingdom, is yours and shall be given you at my return. What a great promise and blessing this is in this beatitude. A great one indeed. What else do we learn here about this beatitude? Is that this is really super unique compared to all the other beatitudes. If you think of it, all the other ones are about what you are and what you are to do. But this beatitude is really about what is done to you. Namely, blessed are you when you are persecuted. When people come and attack you, then you be blessed. So it's not as much what we do, but what is done to us, there is the blessing. So it's unique. The third thing I note about this, we note together, is how strange, really, this is, isn't it? I mean, if you were never to have heard it before at first hearing, I mean, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, blessed, happy, and joyful are you when they attack you to destroy you. Doesn't that sound strange? Like the opposite of the way we would normally think, naturally anyway, or as the world would think, it's the opposite of the way the world would think of persecution in this life, isn't it? I mean, what does the world say? What would their beatitude be? They'd say, blessed, happy, and joyful are you, Jesus, when, no, not when you're persecuted or attacked, but when you're not persecuted, when you're not attacked, when you're friends with the world. When everybody loves you and honors you and lifts you up your name as great, heralds you as, as wonderful, and you're at ease and at peace with the world, Jesus, not when they're attacking you. Blessed are you, Jesus, when you and the world get along like two peas in a pod. That's what they would say. Jesus, are you a masochist or something? Do you enjoy pain? What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? You're wrong. What does Jesus say to that? Jesus says, no world, you're wrong. You've got it all wrong again. For rather, blessed, happy, and joyful are you when you are persecuted. For if you get along with the world and all men speak well of you, well, so their fathers did to the false prophets, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6. But happy, blessed, and joyful are you when you don't get along with the world. When they attack you, yes, blessed indeed are you then. So that's really strange, at least to the untrained, unchristian ear. Strange indeed. Blessed are you, Jesus says here, when you are attacked by the world. 
So the next one we want to ask here is why? <laughs> why does Jesus say that you are blessed, happy, and joyful when you are attacked, when you're persecuted, when the world comes against you to destroy you? Answer is because you're not just being persecuted here for any cause, right? What are you persecuted for according to this per beatitude? Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness's sake. In other words, when they come against you for this just cause, that you're standing up for what's right, that you are believing what's right, that you are standing for the truth, and that you're suffering for that. When you're fighting for the right, then you're blessed. When you suffer for those kinds of things, indeed you are. Why? Because really when you're standing up for the right, what you're really standing up, Jesus says, for is me. You're standing up for me as your king, for I am what is right, and you're standing up for my kingdom. Blessed, happy, and joyful are you when you're standing up and bearing abuse on account of me for having my name as king upon you and confessing it, then you're blessed indeed when you're standing up for me. For this is what he says in greater detail in the next verse. He says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. He says, falsely on my account, when you are suffering for me, for your faith in me. Rejoice and be glad, he says. And in Luke 6, it says, leap for joy for your reward is great in heaven. For so the men persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, when you stand up for me as king, Jesus says, when you stand up and bear abuse for my kingdom, when you fight for the right, for the cause of God in this evil world, and for the cause of the truth, when you bear my name before the world, when you serve my kingdom and they attack you for that, oh, blessed indeed are you. Because you show that by these sufferings, that you are one of mine. Because the world is over there, and if you, they're attacking you, that means you're with me. And if you're with me, oh, blessed indeed are you then. Leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. So we see here that when we say that this is a unique uh, beatitude because it's what's done to you rather than what you do, that's only kind of true. Really, it is what you are. It is what you do again in this beatitude, uh, namely that you're a Christian and you're standing up for your king. When you do that and suffer for it, oh, leap for joy, Jesus says, for the kingdom is yours now and I will give it to you at my return. Isn't this a great promise? Say amen. amen. These are great things. But why must we suffer for Jesus' name? Why must we be attacked in this world for going after what's right? I mean, Think of it. What have we done to deserve all this trouble from the world? Frankly, all we're doing is good and what's right. For aren't we just confessing Jesus as the rightful, true king of this world, as indeed he is? The whole world was made through him, after all. Isn't he the one great savior who gave his life for us on the cross, even for all mankind and the world to reconcile it to God by grace through his shed blood? What's wrong with this? And how about Jesus when he was here? All he did was go about doing good, says Peter, and healing everybody who is oppressed by the devil. Why is it wrong to serve this king? He's the, he's, he is the true king. And are we not just Christians doing good? That's our whole aim in life, is to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and King, and to follow him, to do good to everybody we meet with all kindness and to save them through the preaching of the gospel. What did we do to deserve trouble from the world, frankly? Why did they attack us and persecute and assail us for this, according to Jesus? Well, the answer is because, frankly, there is a great cosmic war going on in the heavenly places between two great princes. It's Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the true Prince of Heaven, versus the Prince of Darkness, the evil one, the devil. Satan is against Jesus. Jesus is against Satan. And Jesus has heaven and the Christians. And the devil has the world and all of his dominion of darkness. So no wonder the world's going to attack you because it follows 
the evil one. Jesus, uh, or say, uh, John the Apostle says, we know that we're of God. And the whole world is in the power of the evil one. Is that true? Is the prince of darkness still at large in the world? Is he still running and ruling the world in a certain sense? Yeah. Remember when Jesus uh, was in the wilderness and to face the devil when he was fasting, the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said, to you I will give all this authority and all their glory for it's been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. Look, he's got power to promote with rank and title fame and fortune and lands and pleasures of this world, anybody who will serve him. So serve me, Jesus, he said in the great warfare. But Jesus just whipped out and brandished the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and said, it is written, and be gone from me, devil. And he defeated him. But it's war. That's why we have to suffer for doing only what's right and good and true in this world, and serving the rightful king, Jesus. Jesus says this, and listen carefully. He says, if you're with me, and I'm at war with them, then they are going to be at war with you. If you were of the world, he says in John 15, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, namely to be my own in my kingdom, therefore the world hates you, says Jesus. And so, you will bear abuse in this world. It's just unavoidable uh, for bearing my name, the name of the true king, Jesus, and being loyal to me and to my kingdom. Therefore, the devil and the world will attack you. And as Paul said, indeed, everybody, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, in this world that is, will be persecuted. It's true. While evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived. All right, so okay, it's war. That's why you have to suffer. Now, does that trouble you? That's a kind of tough word, isn't it? I'm telling you today that you're going to have to fight for the rest of your life in this world and bear abuse. But for your encouragement, I'd like to uh, ask now, to what then might I liken this age? Or what illustration could I use for your inspiration. You know me before today. I'm going to give you my famous one I love the most, the story of Robin Hood, because I think it just perfectly, aptly describes our situation. Remember Robin, he was a Saxon noble in England who lived in peace while Richard the Lionheart was upon the throne. Lived in peace. But then, remember, uh, the king of England, Richard, went away one day on a crusade to the Holy Land, and in his absence his evil brother, Prince John, usurped the throne with the help of his evil Norman knights. And so Robin, who was doing only what's right, serving the rightful king in his absence, what did he get now for that? Warfare with Prince John, to fight the good fight of the faith, to hold England for Richard until he comes. Meanwhile, what does Prince John do? He ravages the countryside, torments everyone, burnings, pillages, rapes, murders, and such things, while Robin and his men had to fight him. Robin and his men, therefore, had to be counted by the prince of that kingdom, John, as outlaws, and hunted and hounded mercilessly to be destroyed if only John could catch them, while Richard was away. And friends, that's the exact situation we are in our present age. Where while our king is away, Jesus, Richard the Lionheart, we are to do our best to hold England, that is the world, for him, do good in this life. While the evil prince John the devil has sought to usurp the throne and his kingdom of darkness, darkness ravages the countryside. We too have to be counted as outlaws in this age for the sake of loyalty to our true king. Hounded and hunted at every turn and vilified wherever we go for our loyalty to him. And Jesus says, this is what I'm calling to you in this, to, in this beatitude. To be counted as outlaws for your loyalty to Richard, namely to me, to the Lionheart, to the Lion of the tribe of Judah. For Jesus in this story this illustration is Richard, 
the devil is Prince John, and you are Robin and his merry men, the men of Sherwood. Is that not a good inspiration for you? For Jesus says, when the true king returns, Richard, the Lionheart, Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, at the last day, all you who have remained loyal to me in the face of this evil usurper and against him, all you have been loyal to me, I shall reward on that day with great rewards. Your reward shall be great in heaven, and this is yours, my kingdom, now, and I shall give it to you then at my return. Great illustration, I think, for me to be inspired, and I'm sure, hopefully, also for you, for your encouragement. We need encouragement in this because guess what? The fight is hard and may get a lot harder, do you think? You know, we've lived it pretty easy, easy so far in the United States of America because we have lived, if you will, in a very Christian-friendly country throughout most of our lives, but the fight to come could be fierce and we need to remain loyal to our king. It's he who endures to the end, Jesus says, that will be saved. It's incumbent upon us to stand for him, even if the fight gets the fiercer. Is it, is it going to get harder, do you think, for us as Christians or easier? It's been kind of easy so far for a lot of us. I mean, we've borne some reproach because our Christian, though, our, our, our country was founded on Christian principles. The justice system based upon the Bible. The schools were filled with the word and with prayer. And our government had been and has been to some degree friendly down through the centuries to us, to the gospel. And that's been good. I'm so glad of it. I've really enjoyed and praised God for that. But would you say the persecution is coming? Is there a dark shadow spreading its hand, itself like a great fierce hand over our world, our country, and even the entire earth? Is it on the increase in the warfare to get the worse? You know, when Jesus says here, uh, blessed are you who are persecuted, that doesn't just mean when you bear, you know, a little inconvenience on the side for him, although that's part of it. But Dioko, when you will be pursued, pursued with violently with repeated acts of hostility, followed hard after, sore pressed to be crushed, hunted down, attacked. They will come at you, says Jesus, with an eagerness to destroy you for my name's sake, to drive you out, to violently abuse you, to force their way upon you and to literally hurt you in some way, if not, if possible, to kill you. Are you ready for that one? How about this? He says, Blessed are you when you're reviled for my name's sake. And I did so. When they will slander and disparage you, that means. When they will scold and defame you. When they will rage and rail at you. When they will assail and assault you. Men of Sherwood, are you ready to bear that kind of approach, reproach as outlaws for your king? Say amen. amen. Has the persecution been increasing, do you think, for Christians in our time? Yeah. Well, you know what? In recent years in our country, we've seen things going on that we never would have imagined decades ago. Even just some years ago in sports, there was a Coach Kennedy out there in uh, Washington State by the Bremington uh, School District. He would bow his knee just to himself, to bow to Jesus, that is, at the end of each game and to pray. He was told by the school district, quote, strict, strict adherence is required and expected, and violations cannot be tolerated. You will not bow your knee to Jesus in public ever again at these games. What did he do as a good Christian, as a man of Sherwood? I'd bow anyway to my king. He did so, and he was fired and lost his job, if you recall. It's war, I tell you. There's a student valedictorian Erica Corder. This is several years ago. She was the number one student at her school. She was going to give the valedictorian speech at her graduation, and she was told, but you shall not mention the name of Jesus. We know you. You're a Christian. You won't do it. We'll get you. And she boldly and defiantly called Jesus Christ her Savior in that speech, though it wasn't written in her pre-approved speech. She gave glory to Jesus as her king, and what happened to her? She didn't get her diploma. They did not give it to her. We know in our government in recent years, we've heard that the IRS has been weaponized to attack Christians and their organizations. And now in recent years, man, that seems like old stuff. The authorities have even, at times over the last several years, in good old U.S. of A, sent police 
to shut down even church services and arrest pastors, which they've done, while keeping liquor stores and gambling casinos open because Prince John, you know, loves those. But he doesn't want the men of Sherwood out in these days. So we are at war, friends, in our days. But really, what are we bearing more than the men of Sherwood throughout the centuries have borne our brothers and sisters in the other countries for the last 2,000 years? If it's our time to suffer some, is that not a good and a glory and an honor for us? There have been 70 million Christians who have been martyred since the days of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? 70 million? The last century had more martyred for bearing Jesus' name than all the other centuries combined. Today, if you go to North Korea, and you're, if you were there, and you were, don't go there, by the way, <laughs> and you're a Christian, if you possess merely this book, you can be arrested and put into a confined prison camp or killed. If you're in Nigeria, one of the worst, two th since 2009, 50,000 of our brothers and sisters, Christians, have been killed there for bearing Christ's name. 18,000 churches and 2,100 Christian schools set ablaze, burned, ravaging the countryside, as Prince John. Pakistan, uh, a Christian woman there, Asiya Bibi, was charged because her uh, neighbor just didn't like her. And so she is charged as blaspheming Allah, and she was put into prison for eight years. And under the sentence of death, but she was released and told, get out of the country because the mob will kill you otherwise. And I could give you many more examples, friends, many, many more. Are you ready, though, to be Robin and his merry men and strike a blow for Richard in England, for Jesus on this earth, while the evil Prince John yet rages the countryside till we await as we're awaiting the return of the king? So how does this uh, sermon move you so far? Are you a little more on edge? Well, should we, should we be afraid of this? Should we cower? Should we uh, tremble? Should we fear? Should we give in? Answer, no way and never. Let's consider what Jesus wants to be our attitude, which is clearly expressed in this beatitude for us. You know, let me say it this way. It's Jesus, not Robin, but Jesus and his merry Christians, right? It's not Robin and his fearful men. It's not Robin and his cowering crusaders. It's Robin and his merry men, and it's Jesus and his merry Christians. Look at what it says. Jesus says, when they do these things to you, rejoice. Luke 6, leap for joy into the air, for your reward is great in heaven, and the kingdom is yours. This attitude Jesus wants for us as we go through this age is not one of fear, but complete confidence and fearlessness and joy. You know what Paul says? When they were facing the strife in their days, in Philippians 1, he says to the church there, he says, Strive side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear omen, or sign, to them of their coming destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. So we want a steely eye, an undaunted courage, a courageous heart, and great good cheer with love as we go through these days. Don't be afraid of any of this, but stand ready for it. Because we can go through with joy for these reasons, as just some of them. Because number one, you, through your persecution, for Christ's name, get to give glory to God. Because God's going to be in heaven, look down on you, bearing reproach for, for him, and he's going to say, look what they're bearing for me. I get the greater glory for this. What joy this is to my heart. And he will get the greater glory, and the angels will clap their hands in heaven. So that's one reason we can be happy. Another one is God is actually bestowing honor upon you. Whenever you're persecuted for his name's sake, this is good, because you're only then in the tradition of all the saints. Remember, Jesus says, for so their fathers did to the prophets. You're in the line of the prophets if you suffer for Jesus' name. You're in the same company as these greats, Abel. Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, John the Baptist and all the apostles and Paul and all the saints through time, you are in their company who also suffered attacks, persecutions, slanders, impeding, uh, beatings, imprisonments, 
and even death. Yes, you're giving glory. When the, when the apostles were charged and beaten and said, don't preach anymore in Jesus' name, they went out from the presence of the council, leaping for joy, saying, huh, God has counted us worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Hooray! This is a great thing, because it will redound or turn into your greater glory for a greater reward when he comes, too. And also, next, you're never closer to your king or know his love for you than when you suffer for him. Isn't that true? You know, Paul says, At my first defense, no one took my part. All deserted me. May it not be charged against them. They all rushed upon him like a, an angry mob, a whole army against one man. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength to proclaim the word fully, that all the Gentiles might hear it, so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. And ah, oh, the Lord will rescue me from every evil and save me for his heavenly kingdom. Do you want to experience the might of the Lord uh, coursing through your veins like electric, living energy of light? Well, get persecuted. You'll feel it. The Lord will be with you. I'll not leave you alone. Your king stands with you to empower you so we can rejoice in that. And Jesus says, in these persecutions, I'm just shaping and sharpening you, making you worthy and fit for my kingdom. As Paul says in 2 Thessalonians to the Christians there, your persecutions, your sufferings, which you're enduring, they're just making you worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're suffering. And Jesus says, there is a great reward for this. I will reward you at my return. For you know the end of the story, right? Robin Hood, you ever watch that? Errol Flynn, come on, Olivia de Havilland. We'll watch it this winter. We'll watch it, I'll make sure. You know the end of the story. Robin and his men were not counted as outlaws and hunted forever. The king, Richard, returns in brilliance and glory in surprise at the end. And what happens at that point is Prince John and his evil knights go down. Robin and his company of merry men go up. They are the ones who are honored, who have castles and lands and titles and rank and joy forever with the king in the kingdom. It's a happily ever for after, friends, and so too with us in Christ. Jesus says, rejoice for this slight momentary affliction, says Paul. It's just preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Rewards, and what is the real great reward? Blessed are you when you're persecuted, for yours is the kingdom of heaven now, and it shall be given you by Richard the Lionheart, Jesus the King, when he returns. I will give it to you who have suffered persecution for not my name, and that with great joy, after the fight for a reward everlasting. So, in conclusion, dear Christian friends and brothers, sisters, let's be ready, though, for the fight to stand for Jesus in our day. Come what may, it doesn't matter, we don't care about that. This is to the glory of our King, and it's the fight of our day on the battle as well. For here, friends, we don't have a lasting city. We're seeking this city which is to come. Let's therefore go outside the gates and bear abuse for him. For we have a better country, a heavenly one. God has prepared for us, and therefore he's not ashamed to be called our God, for he has prepared for us a city and a kingdom. So, men of Sherwood, Robin and his merry men, until Richard returns, let's fight the good fight of the faith, for he is the lion heart, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he comes, so oh, believe me, then it's just trumpets and fanfare and joy forevermore. And that's coming soon. Mark it well, the words of our king. Blessed, happy, and joyful are you. Merry indeed. When you are persecuted for my sake, for my kingdom and my name, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. <laughs>